And now we'll continue with visualization analysis and design uh, with more about color. So let's think about different spaces that we can use to uh, discuss and compute and uh, build things according to color. So there's a lot of different color spaces. You can think of these as mathematical models of color that we can use often in the design of tools to help people select or use colors. So with one of these, we've already talked quite a bit about it, this idea that luminance and saturation and hue are really tied to visual channels. So this is great for visual encoding. I'm gonna call luminance L star, hue H and saturation S. Here's the problem. Almost no tools allow you to actually do anything with this color space. Unfortunately, visualization has not yet taken over the world. In a standard computer graphics or sort of web design context, you're not usually given access to this color space. So what do you have? Well, the RGB color space that stands for red, green, blue is a great color space for display hardware. So a lot of tools have that built in. And in that color space, you basically can think of that very easily as a cube uh, where you're varying blue and red and green. So the colors of that cube are the highly saturated colors. And then we've got the black and the white for the other two colors of that cube. And everything's great, except um, fantastic for hardware, but very poor for visual encoding because we can't easily interpret things like some green, you know, less green and more green, uh, less red and more red, what we're getting is we just perceive a combined color here, as I already mentioned when we were talking about channels. And moreover, if we're thinking about interpolation, then it's actually really problematic because if you interpolate two triplets of RGB colors, you will often end up with colors that don't seem to be anywhere along a conceptual line between them. Uh, so it's really a poor color space for um, interpolating color. So RGB is not our solution. Well, what else is there? Um, there is a color space, which is fantastic for interpolation, um, except it's hard to interpret and it's not so great for encoding. And that space is actually the space we talked about when we were discussing color deficiency. This perceptual processing space where there's a luminance channel L star and then these two chroma channels, A star is the red green axis, B star is the yellow blue axis. This color space has been like essentially derived by direct measurements of how humans perceive color. So in that sense, um, what's great is it is a perceptually uniform space that's really good for interpolating between two colors, computing a path in between two colors sort of matches how we would think about that. Unfortunately, it's very hard to think about. It doesn't have a nice simple cube shape like RGB. It's this weird, distorted, complicated shape. So it's really hard to reason about it. Um, the, these two um, chroma channels of red, green, and yellow, blue, they just don't map to how uh, people think about color. So unfortunately, although it's great for interpolation, not so good for visual encoding. There's another space. So HSL, HSV, that is somewhat better. So let's talk through that. Um, many of you have probably used color pickers where there is a hue saturation wheel like we see in the upper uh, middle. So fully saturated colors are on the outside of the circle. And then as you go towards the center, you're getting less and less saturated until as we see in this case, you hit white exactly in the middle. And this is an intuitive way for people to think about color. Um, so the thing is, what about that other dimension, this dimension we're gonna call value? So one of these models, the one on the right, we have that um, wheel of hue and saturation, and then we can change the value. And notice how it's not a cylinder, it's a cone, because the darker we get, the less we're able to distinguish between these different hues. And by the time we hit the tip of that cone, when we're at pure black, right, that there's just that one thing, which is black. So we have this cone shape. There's another, and that's called hue saturation value. Um, there's the hue saturation lightness, which is a double cone model, as if we took two cones and smacked them together. And in this one, we've got the tip of the top cone is pure white, the tip of the bottom cone is pure black, and then halfway in between is gray. 
And so in this color space, um, desaturated is gray rather than white. Now, one important thing is, again, I really want to emphasize value or and saturation are not very separable channels at all. Um, so we typically don't try to distinguish between them when we're visually encoding. Uh, we're typically distinguishing between changes of hue versus this luminance saturation combo. But here's what's really tricky, is whether it's lightness or value, these are not perceptual. It's not a perceptual color space. So these values are not equal to true luminance, which we're going to distinguish as L star. So L versus L star, it really matters. Um, the example, again, from Maureen Stone is look at these different RGB colors. Um, notice how blue is a lot darker than the yellow. So from the point of view, if you computed true luminance, these would be really different. But in this HLS or HSV color space, they're the same. In fact, all of the corners of that RGB color cube, the red and the green and the cyan and the magenta, these are all the same lightness. And so it is a non-perceptual color space. So beware when you're using a standard color picker if you're trying to do visualization design. So there are many color spaces. Typically, none of them are perfect. If we had more tools that actually did luminance, hue, and saturation, that would be great, but that's not our current state of affairs. All right, another topic in color is contrast and also names. So as I mentioned, luminance contrast is completely crucial to be able to read anything. So be very, very careful when you are doing any kind of labeling, especially if you're in a situation where a label might overlap um, many different visually encoded marks of different colors, is it going to be legible? Um, maybe you'll have to explicitly have some sort of a, a background uh, for that text, because as you see from these uh, ludicrous examples of terrible readability, things like yellow against white, not going to be legible. Uh, red text against a blue background, extremely difficult because that would be trying to use hue for edge detection, but we need luminance contrast for edge detection. One thing to be aware of, um, is although yellow, um, very, very bright high luminance yellow marks might be just fine against a low luminance background like a dark color, it's going to be needing to be quite a different yellow if you've got a high luminance background like white. So notice how here uh, these are really different yellows in order to be legible against the background. Uh, one thing to think about explicitly. And this is just one example of the more general principle, which is. Um, Remember that we see very different things because, again, the human visual system is doing relative perception. So here is a photograph, an actual real world photograph of two different identical color swatches. Uh, John McCann took this image and I got to it courtesy of Maureen Stone. And it's a dumb question to say, do they match, right? No, here's the yellow, sorry, here's the white one and here's the black one. Of course, they don't match. But if I actually mask out the surrounding context, in fact, that's the same color. What's happening here? One is in shadow, one is in sunlight. We have basically automatic white balancing in our perceptual system so that we're automatically taking into account the illumination conditions. This is fantastic for the real world so that we don't you know, get confused about whether shadows are actually a physical object or not. This is great for having you know, my red sweater look red to me both when I'm inside with um, artificial light and outside with natural sunlight. But it's terrible if we're trying to design visualizations where we are visually encoding with color because um, this problem of what is around color influences our perception of it. So uh, it's very tricky when we're trying to encode data uh, because of the way our brain is trying to automatically calibrate for the lighting conditions. So we see this with things like I can tell you that all the bars on the top are one color dark gray and all the ones on the bottom are one color light gray. But when I systematically change the background as we see on the right, it's almost impossible, even if you cognitively know this, to avoid this perception of, oh, but these are different colors as we move across sideways. For those of you who were on the internet a few years ago when there was a big kerfuffle about this, uh, the dress, that's because it depends on whether you are interpreting the illumination conditions 
as light versus shadow. That is how some people were able to see black and blue versus white and gold for the same picture. It's the same phenomenon. And that was a particularly strong example and it captured the imagination of a lot of people. This is something you need to take into account if you're using color to convey information with a visual encoding. Another example of this uh, effect is what's called the bezel effect, which is the outline color really affects how you perceive colors. Here's two uh, very different feeling examples of what of course is the same underlying base color, depending on whether it's outlined in white or in black. So all this is to say that if we have, even in these very um, precise perceptual color space, can we tell what color something is? No, because it's not just about the color, the way your uh, visual system interprets it. It's about what other colors are near it, um, the adaptation of our eye to both the colors we see and the brightness levels, this phenomenon of colors next to each other changing how we perceive that simultaneous contrast, and also effects of how big or small things are. Um, it's why when you have a paint chip in the paint store, uh, it feels really different than if you painted a 10 foot wall, all that color, uh, as a lot of interior designers know, even the viewing angle of where you're looking from. So all of these things affect the color appearance um, and it makes color for visualization and coding a particularly tricky topic. We've only um, hit the tip of the iceberg on this. I'll briefly talk about color names. Uh, there was sort of a joke going around about um, whether women use a lot more color names than men uh, in general, um, in part due to some uh, fashion choices uh, in terms of how things are marketed and what kinds of colors you'll see on women's clothing versus men's clothing. Um, the great XKCD actually did a survey where they got an incredible amount of data that's actually been repurposed for a lot of scientific studies, uh, showing that there were indeed um, some discrimination differences, although not as extreme as the original joke. But, and here's the part I want you to think about, that nameability is actually important in visualization because it affects your ability to communicate about colors to somebody else. Um, in a visual representation and also the memorability of them. And so there's been some recent color models that actually combine a quantifiable um, nameability metric as well as these perceptual metrics to get these combined uh, ideas of what are good colors to use by both metrics of perception and nameability. So color is only part of the visual system um, it doesn't directly help you perceive things like spatial position or shape or motion, um, but there's a lot of complexity to color. So what about these other channels? I've been really focused on color, but let's now talk a little bit about um, the, the channels that are not spatial position and are not color. So angle is an interesting one or tilt or orientation. These are all synonyms. What's great about angle is it sort of acts a bit like color in that you can get different mappings depending on the range. So if you're going from zero uh, to 90 degrees and you're just varying between that there, then you actually can have the properties of sequential. Now it's gonna help in this discussion if we don't just think about a line mark, but think about some sort of uh, arrow glyph so that we can tell the head from the tail of this. But if we actually allow ourselves to vary from zero to 180, then we can get something diverging where there's the vertical and then you diverge in either direction towards the horizontal. And we can even get cyclic properties if we allow that direction to go all the way around from zero to 360 wrapping. And so that's one interesting property of angle. The other is that we perceive angle in a nonlinear way we're really good at noticing exact horizontal, exact vertical, exact diagonal. So you can notice the difference between, you know, 90 degrees and 89 degrees, as many of you have probably noticed when you're trying to get straight lines, when you're say making PowerPoint slides or something, you can notice really subtle things that are different. And we've even got that diagonal good, but at other orientations, you don't notice it. You can't notice like 37 versus 38 or maybe even 37 versus 35. There are, once you are not at these exact um, positions, we are much less able to notice discrepancies, which is an interesting um, situation that has some implications for visual encoding. 
So we'd already talked about size quite a bit, but let me just come back to it in the context of how many bins can you recognize? Um, how many discriminable bins are there? There are a lot for aligned length, you know, incredibly high precision. Um, in some cases, maybe even down to a single pixel um, on a, a thousand by a thousand pixel screen. Um, we're very accurate for length, definitely um, hundreds uh, of bins that we're going to be able to notice. Um, whereas with 2D area, there are fewer bins. In addition to um, having less accurate perception, we are let, there are fewer discriminable bins for area. Similarly, even as volume is something that we are much less accurately able to perceive, we can, set, we can actually distinguish between fewer levels, fewer bins of this uh, channel. Shape is interesting and complicated. Um, we decomposed color into these three lower level channels of luminance and saturation and hue. Now, there's quite a lot of evidence uh, from the psychology literature that shape is also decomposable into lower level primitives, but it's not yet as fully understood as color is. So what is clear is there are many different shapes that we can perceive. Um, for many purposes in visualization, we're not um, yet quite working at the level of you know, decomposable primitives, and we just think, are these shapes distinguishable from each other or not. And so we treat it as a single channel with many bins, but there's definitely complexity underneath that. And then finally with motion, um, a key thing to know is that this is a highly, highly separable channel, very separable against any of the static channels. Um, that means it's great for highlighting, uh, especially if you're highlighting just a binary thing of its, um, if you're trying to visually indicate that a highlight is there or is not as a binary state. Um, but, and in particularly if you have multiple views and you've highlighted something in one view and you want to see where the corresponding thing is in the other view and you need to draw the viewer's attention to that. Um, but exactly that strength is also the weakness. If you have a visual encoding that's intent where everything else is static and the user is not interacting, it can be very difficult to look away from something like blinking um, or oscillating or moving. So use motion cues with great care um, in a non-interactive context because they can be so difficult to not attend to that they could be um, actively irritating. 